Um, thank you very much for coming. And um, today, as uh, Kumal laid out, the purpose of today's talk is to talk is to discuss uh, the idea of differences of opinion in in uh, Shia thought, uh, in particular in, within fiqh. Uh, it is very one of the big things that we see right now is a a push towards this idea of uniformity that there is no difference of opinion within um, within our faith and that uh, difference should be uh, criticized. Uh, what I'm going to try and show today is that difference not only should not be criticized but actually should be celebrated uh, very much given that that is the reality of our history and actually understanding our history and seeing the development of thought through our history will help us understand how these differences of opinion have been so instrumental in creating what we have today. In the very early days of Islam, as, as we'll see soon, the views were, in, on many issues, very different to the views that we have right now. And the only way that that change happened was through scholars who had a very different view which might have been a minority view at that time, but have become a majority view today. And the key point I want to try and get across, and hopefully will come across through all of the examples that I show, is that differences of opinion at any stage very often are the instigator for massive change in the future and should be therefore celebrated as part of our faith rather than necessarily thrown aside. So the, to start off, um, this, this saying attributed to Ayatollah Khomeini is, is, a, is the starting point where I say the books of the great fuqaha of Islam are filled with differences of opinion. In some issues there's, there is even the consensus of the scholars but even in these issues there's sometimes one opinion against this apparent consensus. Can we imagine that those who had a difference of opinion were working against what Allah wants and against Islam and the truth? Never. He was making a very clear point that sometimes even when there is a consensus on some issues, when a scholar who, who is someone of integrity has gone through the, their research and come to a different conclusion, that conclusion is something that is very important to be thought of in and of itself and not necessarily attacked because very often that one opinion ends up becoming the majority. Not very often. Sometimes that uh, individual opinion might end up becoming the majority opinion. And look, you, let's just look through time and you can start seeing this uh, coming out quite a lot. Um, this is a, a short whistle-stop -top tour of the changes in, in our Shia history. So th this is my attempt at, at it's not perfect, um, but it shows a lot of the different scholars through different times, um, from the early days of, of Islam um, until now. And what I've tried to do is, is put them into different themes. It's not my own um, analysis. Other people have, have put it in this way, and I'm just sort of summarizing it. So obviously in, in the early days you have the Prophet and the Imam and straight after that you, I've talked about there being a traditionist approach. And what I mean by that is that there, this, this traditionist approach which happened in the early days is not far off what, what, what some people would consider the Hanbali school. It, w it was very much reliant on traditions um, uh, and these people who, who are in this era are the, the Kulaini, Sheikh Saduq and others. But they were, if you like, in the early stages had a very, very certain way of thinking. It is very different to the next set, which is where you started having a more rationalist approach. And there were two different groups of these, the Ahlul Rai, Rai who were Ibn Abayqil and Ibn al-Junaid. Now, what's really interesting about these scholars is they thought even the very idea of using hadith, which didn't reach a certain level, so um, what they call Khabar al-Wahid. So these are individual narrations, or even many narrations, it didn't reach the level of Mutawatir. In other words, there weren't so many narrations that you, you should be certain, but there were a few narrations on a topic. These scholars thought that these should not be used to justify law. Today, these are the only things basically that are used to justify law. But in this, in this day and age, these individuals believe that you should not even consider that as a source of law. Now obviously this is right near the beginning of, um, just after the occultation of the 12th Imam, you know, uh, not that far after. So you could argue that, that there was a, a clearer way to get uh, com confirmation, but this is how something which is so fundamental today at that stage was basically considered completely wrong and shouldn't be used by the Ahlul Rai. The Mu'tadri approach, which was founded by Sheikh Mufid in a, a major part, could criticize very much um, 
including his teacher Sheikh Sadu. And he accused Ibn al Junaid, this other group, of Qiyas. Now, in those days, the idea of accusing someone of Qiyas was quite a strong accusation. Qiyas is this idea of analogy. It was something that was very much central towards um, the more, more Sunni thinking compared to the Shia thinking. And Qiyas was, uh, accusing someone of Qiyas was a very, very strong accusation. And there was this very, and, and the, just to show that Sheikh Mufid uh, uh, accused another scholar of, of Qiyas was quite a big thing in, in those days. Then Sharif al murtada later on systematized all this methodology of illegal reasoning. And again, they didn't use these Ahad narrations at this stage. So this is this whole rationalist approach which came straight after the tr traditionist approach, which was again a very, very different way of thinking. And then if you come straight after, you get the school of Sheikh Tusi, where things started to become more systematized. And in that time, this is where the use of these narrations then gained a, l a very strong foothold. And they said, you know what? We need to start using these narrations. How else can we create fiqh? How else can we develop the fiqh? Now, it's worth noting that um, in all of this period, actually the, the laws that people had, the fiqh that was there, was already in place. And all of this was trying to justify, some, some people would argue, and, and, and some, um, uh, quite a lot of historians would argue, that a lot of this trying to understand how this fiqh law comes into place, that all happened after the fiqh was already there. In other words, trying to, after the fact, trying to justify the facts that were there. But this is where it was trying to be systemized in a real way. And the Sheikh, Sheikh Tusi really transformed the way that people thought about how Islamic law would derive. But what's really interesting is that w when you have such a big figure like Sheikh Tusi, such a big figure in, in the, then a lot of the disciples that come straight after often just imitate what happened rather than necessarily think and develop new thinking themselves. And that's where, very interesting, it took a, a bit of time until you have Ibn Idris and others who then went back to Sheikh al murtadas work and actually used the rational method and said Sheikh Tusi was completely wrong. So first we had all these people saying um, you should not use Sheikh, um, these Ahad narrations, individual narrations, which are basically what we need today. Then you had all these people saying, no, actually you should. Then you said all these people saying you shouldn't. That was what was happening. This is a fundamental idea of how can we derive our law? Can we use these narrations, yes or no? And it was so, this is a fundamental thing that drives everything that we have in terms of fiqh today. And there was such a massive difference of opinion and change of opinion through time. And then, um, when people were attacking Sheikh Tusi, guess what? Someone came to defend Sheikh Tusi later on, in, a, in again, a more systematized way with Muhakkak al Hilli and al Alama Hilli, who really created what, what, what many would consider to be the independent way that Shias look at fiqh in, in, in many ways. It, to be like, people talk about the fact that their texts, until today, are looked at very, very favorably, and they are really the core texts that have driven everything until Sheikh Ansari quite recently. Um, and he, this is where a lot of the Sul fiqh law rules were sort of systematized very, very carefully, and this is quite different in the way that it came about doing it. But again, it was, um, it was defending Sheikh Tosi's approach in many ways, uh, which had been otherwise um, attacked quite a lot. And then you had in the Safavid period where you had, um, you know, a, for the first time, to some extent, for the first time, um, Shias involved within the, the rulership, if you like, of a country, because Iran was um, uh, very much a, a bigger influence at this period of time. And this is where you had um, a, a Sheikh Karaki, um, who paid much more attention to the idea of, well, you've got all these laws, how does that impact the state? Um, which again was very important. And you also had probably a, another very, very important scholar, Sheikh Ardabili, who was one of the key teachers of later things that came on. Um, but then you had something, again, fundamentally quite different, changing, where you had this Akhbari school happen. And in this Akhbari school, they basically said, w w this is where um, Sheikh Astrabadi is there, and the, the modern day Akhbarism really started at this point. And you could argue this goes back to the very, very early traditionist school that we talked about, right at the beginning. This sort of really goes back and said, the narrations are everything. This is what drives how we should look at law. We shouldn't be doing too much analysis on the back of it. It really is the, 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 the hadith themselves that should talk for themselves, and they are the basis of everything. It's a bit more complicated than that, but, the, but in principle, that's what was going on. And a lot of major scholars were there. And this is very, very different to what happened just before. This is, uh, and, and at this, during this period of time, these, these couple of hundred years, 
this school of thought, the Akbari school, was really the, the main way that people were thinking about how to derive law. And massively different to the, the scholars of the past. So again, a big change, a sea change in the opposite direction. And you've got, uh, you know, Yusuf al-Bahrani and others, who al hur al-Amali and others who are very, very big scholars um, who came up at that during that time. And then you came back to, the, to where we are today almost, where, you, where the, this Akhbari school was basically again pushed to the side, because, well, not pushed to the side, but the arguments that were made by, uh, mainly by Sheikh Wahid Bihbahani were basically won the day or, or, or transformed. Uh, I mean, there are lots of discussions as to why this happened. There were lots of discussions about people even beating people up on the street. Actually, there were some discussions as, uh, uh, that were happening in, in that way. But in terms of scholarship, um, Sheikh Wahid uh, Bihbahani really re-established the idea that reason actually plays a bigger role. So we, uh, what we've seen through this period is, is a big fluctuation. We'll go one going one way, one going another, saying we shouldn't use these innovations, and we should use these innovations. We should use rationality more, we shouldn't use rationality more. And that's where we are right now, if you like, where Sheikh Ansari created the method which is, in essence, what is used today. So the key point I wanted to make through this Three through this is that our history is full of these changes in methodology and how it works. But what, but what's worth us thinking about is okay. So how, d in principle, do, do does fit get der derived in today's world? So let's let's look at this in a bit bit of detail, um, and um, and and then we can be in a better position to understand why today people have differences of opinion. Now this is a bit complicated, and I apologize for that, but. Um, it's my one my way of putting on a one on one page how fiqh is derived in today's environment. Okay, so we've had all these changes in the past, but today how does fiqh work? Well, what you have is you have a series of assumptions. Okay, you have to start off with assumptions that the Prophet you know everything he says is right. You have certain theological assumptions. You have the imams what they say is 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 the the word of the the lawgiver. In that sense, there's some philosophical and theological assumptions which underpin everything. First, you have to have those assumptions as, sh as Shia Muslims. Okay. Then you have what they consider to be legitimate sources of evidence in the post Shaykh Ansari world. So you obviously have the Quran, you obviously have the Sunnah and, 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 the, and the, the, the actions and the words of the Prophet and the Imams, and those can be split up into mutawatir narrations, and in other words, narrations that are so much um, in circulation that you can be sure they're correct in what they're saying and what they mean. Um, in terms of how many mutawatir narrations there are, in terms of the exact wording, they're very, very few. Even in terms of exact meaning, they're not that many. But there are those ones which have a certain level of certainty. As you can see on the right-hand side, you can't see that. But certainty. Then you come into a level of what, what we consider to be probability, or possibility, actually, is probably better. Where you have widely known narrations, or mashhur, non mutawatir narrations, and non-verbal. In other words, tacit acknowledgement of certain things. All of those things give an indication. The Prophet ﷺ is, is, um, was in a situation where something happened in front of him and he didn't do anything about it. That gives a tacit understanding that it, it could have been allowed. It was allowed. Because otherwise he would have said something to the contrary. And then consensus. The idea of uh, consensus. If there, if there is a consensus of scholars on something, it gives you an indication that that's probably what was the case before. But it's not certain. Because you have lots of examples where that's not the case. And then we have weak narrations, which give an un which give it could be true, it could not be true, but you can't rely on them. So those, if you like, are sources of evidence. Some of which you consider to be legitimate, and depending on the situation, some you could consider not to be. As well as rationality. Now, rationality is a very difficult concept to to, to define. On a purist sense, if you are certain about something, and this is a very difficult idea of how do you define certainty, then that is in 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 theory, certainty is a um, is a legitimate source of, of action. But certainty is a very, very complicated idea, and it's actually one that has lots of different um, arguments on it, and, I, uh, and we can talk about that if, if that comes up later on. Um, but in reality, most of, most of um, rationality is in the probability section. Uh, and this is where there's been a lot of scholarship to understand how do you deal with um, probability in a, a rationality in a probable sense, and we'll come to examples of that later. Um, so you've got all these legitimate sources of evidence. Then you have these, what they call practical procedures. Um, these are what we call usul amaliya, where, they, where you, you can, you, you derive certain um, principles 
Like, for example, the idea that everything is halal until you know it is haram. You have there's certain Quranic verses and other things that come back from that, which create these practical procedures which are used to help derive law. And then you have these principles from Quran and Sunnah. When you look at the Quran as a, or the Quran and, and, and the Sunnah in a holistic sense, what does that give you? What insights does it give you? And those insights are very important because they help shape some of the law. And Ayatollah Khoury uses that in one of the examples which we'll talk about later. So first you have these sources of evidence, but then you have to actually understand them. And that's where this um, hermeneutics and language theory comes in. Are the, is the narration clear? Is what it's saying, act, do you know what it's saying? Or is it possible they might mean something else? If, it, if someone says, read, it, does it mean it's wajib for you to read? Or does it mean it's mustahab for you to read? Or does it mean it might be possible for you to read? What does it mean? How do you define certain orders in the Quran? That's where some of these things come in. Come in. If there are conditions which are made, if those conditions are not there, does that mean that law is entirely unacceptable or not? That's how these hermeneutics in language theory comes in, where you have to try and understand what is going on. And then you have the actual meaning, because it's not just enough to understand the theoretical meaning, but in the context it's given, depending on whether there are other verses or other Quranic ideas or hadith which come in together, that might, there might be abrogation of some or, or not, Understanding what the actual meaning is also important. Now when you have all of these sources of evidence together, you then have to deal with what happens if they're contradictory. What happens if they seem to suggest different things? How do you deal with them? Do you say, actually, we don't do anything, we discard both of them, both sides of the argument? Or do we prefer one side over the other, and if so, why? Or do we try and say both of them are true, but only in certain circumstances? Those are the types of things that you do. And then you have, well, even if all of those things are true, even if you have a Quranic verse, you're sure what it means, you know that there's no contradiction to it, there are still situations where that rule would not apply. For example, if you have certain overall principles, the idea of necessity, if, if it is necessary, you're allowed to break some laws. If, there, uh, if any law creates harm with certain um, um, exceptions, again, that law cannot be applicable. So these la dara and darura ideas are fit rules which... which take precedence over any Islamic law. And then you have the actual practical stance that therefore you have to take. Now, at each one of these stages, there is a possibility for difference of opinion. You could, for example, say that uh, on, the, on the first side, on the left-hand side, on the sunnah or the, or, the, the, on the, or the hadith, people have different views as to whether that hadith is, is, a, is a narration that can be rel relied upon because there's a chain of narration behind it. So it could be that one person in that chain, some people think it's okay, and some people think it's trustworthy, and some people think, no, actually that person is not trustworthy at all and can't be relied upon. So that could be one reason why there could be differences of opinion. There could be differences of opinion when it comes to the idea of principles from the Quran and Sunnah. Is there a real principle here that should be relied upon or not? For example, Ayatollah Sana'i derives the idea of equality of men and women as, as part of his understanding of the Sharia. And he uses that very much as part of his understanding to derive law on, on equality in certain areas. That's not the same as almost every other scholar in the field. But he uses, this is where his difference of opinion is with those other scholars. Then you have the whole idea of the language. So many people have different opinions, and that's just because of the way that they've chosen to interpret certain hadith. And then it could be how you deal with narrations, um, and how you deal with these contradictions that come up. And we'll come to some examples. So at, at any of these stages, there could be, if you use this, this Sheikh, post Sheikh Ansari method that people use, there are lots of reasons why people might have a difference of opinion. So I'm going to quickly go through a number of examples showing you how Islamic law, and this is a summary, it's not the detail. I've chosen to, uh, only six examples here, but we can go to many more if, if people are interested at another stage. But these are just six examples. How are these fiqh laws derived. And I'm going to explain to you how the scholars have arrived at their judgment, what is their justification for that conclusion, and you will see why there might be differences of opinion at each stage. So let's start with moon sighting, just because it's something that people seem to care about quite a lot for some reason. So you say um, the Quranic verse, okay? So you have um, the key bit, uh, um, the key element of one of the verses of the Quran. It says, min kumushar fal yasum. Whoever of you shahida witnesses, sees, lots of different meanings potentially, the month, let him fast. Fal yasum. Again, whether that's, um, um, yeah, so the, the, that's it. There are three potential meanings for this word shahida. Okay? One is the moon 
the moon, even though there's no moon mentioned, the moon must be seen, actually seen. That's the view of um, Sheikh Bahrani, who's in the early stages, one of the Akbari scholars that, that's very well respected until today, Yusuf al-Bahrani. His work on al-Hadaq is, is, is still till today really, really very well um, uh, respected, and Ayatollah Khoury spends a lot of time talking about Sheikh Bahrani in some of his works. So the moon must be seen. Another meaning is you must be present at home and not be traveling. That's another view, and actually the view of the majority of scholars according to this, um, this text that I was looking at. And the other one saying is you have to be certain that the month has started. In other words, it's nothing to do with the moon, um, and no actual ramification. Just, it's just saying that once the, the month has come, once you're sure the month has come, you have to start fasting. In other words, the majority of scholars, this verse plays no judgment in the idea of moon sighting. However, for Sheikh Bahrani, it did. Let's see, but, but there, are other, there are other Quranic verses. There's another one which says, yes, alunaka anil ahilla. They ask you about the crescents. Say they're fixed periods for people in Hajj. Again, there are three different views here. Um, how does the, um, how do the, um, the Urf, the people at the time, how would they have interpreted this idea that you have to wait, that, that the crescent is important when it comes to determining these various um, uh, important parts of, of, of the calendar? According to Allah Mahili, that was sufficient to say that a sighting is required. That was what he used, Allah Mahili. Um, then, it, then it says that other people interpret this, this verse of Quran completely differently, just saying that there are fixed numbers of, of, of months, and that's what you should do. That's what um, um, Ayat al-Sabzwari and others have, have, have said. And then others say it's actually just saying, look, there are different, there are different crescents here and there, this type of crescent, wider crescent, etc. What's clear, I'm just saying, is that, again, scholars have come up with different reasons for this simple verse. But in reality, um, uh, oh, sorry, where am I going? There we go. Um, in reality, it's this, it's, this, um, it's this specific narration from Imam um, As-Sadiq um, and other similar narrations, there are lots like this, which actually is the driver of how you decide what, what you do when it comes to the moon. And it basically says, and there, there are lots of different ones, and I've translated it just to make it easier. If you see the moon, and see is a different, uh, is a, uh, an interesting concept. If you see the moon, then fast in Ramadan, and if you see it, then break your fast. Then when you see the moon, that's what counts. Now the argument one is that the sighting should be, when you say see, you mean a physical, actual sighting of the moon. That's one option. And that's what people would understand from it. Um, and that's one argument to say that actually needs to be something that also, and you, you add a theological argument, which is what, what some scholars do, and say that, well, if it wasn't actual sighting, then the imams and the prophet at that time, they would have done something wrong. Because at that time, they couldn't have used calculations or anything like that. They would have done what they could do at that time. And they would use theology to support their argument, to say, actually, it has to be a sighting of the moon with your eyes. Because if it was with telescopes or things that weren't invented at that time, those imams and the Prophet وسلم, would have fasted on Eid, which would have been haram, and they can't do something haram. So that's one argument that's used. Another argument is saying, well, look, when it comes to seeing, you can see with your eye, but you can see in many different ways. You don't have to see with your eye, but if you have other ways of seeing, you can see with other things. And therefore you can use, because there is no restriction in this one, it doesn't say if you see with your eye only. It says if you see. And if it doesn't specify, there's something called itla, this idea that you can use any option to see in any way, and that would still be counted as seeing, and therefore using a telescope would be fine as well, because you're still seeing it. And then there's a third argument, saying, look, it's not about seeing. What it's saying is that there's a purpose of this seeing, that there is a moon in the sky to be seen. And if that moon is there to be seen, and it's sightable, that's enough, because that's clearly what is intended by the verse. Those are three very, very different um, interpretations of the exact same, um, of the exact same um, hadith. And so all I'm saying, this, this shows that simply by interpreting a very simple verse, a simple hadith in this case, you can get a very, very different view. Let's try another example. Playing with instruments of gambling without gambling. So there are lots of um, verses of the Quran on this. Um, in Surah Baqarah it says they ask you about intoxicants and games of chance Mesa. say in both of them there is a great sin and a means of profit or benefit for men or people and their sin is greater than their profit that's one verse another one is saying the shaitan only desires to cause enmity and hatred to spring in your midst by means of intoxicants and games of chance Mesa. 
And other narrations use something very, and there are lots of narrations which talk about qimar as something that should be avoided. And qimar, uh, let's just ignore that for now. So argument one that you could do through, through understanding these verses, which, are, which one would argue is quite clear. Look, it's clear that it's saying that um, these games of chance, this mesir, is imp impos uh, impermissible, it's haram, for any type. Because it doesn't give any, it doesn't give exceptions here. It just says, they ask you about them. In both of them, there's a great sin. Finished. It's simple. It's clear. There's nothing else you can say. That's one argument. Then there's another argument saying, well, it might be that actually the, the first thing that comes to people's minds when you're talking about these things, given the context in which they were recited, they, 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 these verses came in, actually they're talking about games of chance where people were exchanging money. Because in those days, that's what was happening a lot. And therefore the apparent meaning, the first thing that would come to someone's mind in who was understanding it at that time would be game of chance where money was being exchanged. That's clearly not relevant to a situation where money is not being exchanged today. And therefore, given the fact that you have a, a, a practical principle that everything is allowed unless you know it's not allowed, in this situation you have nothing to suggest that things today where there is no element of gambling associated with it should um, should be uh, considered haram. Again, two different opinions, both of which made by major scholars, and and they come to different conclusions from the exact same Quranic verses and um, uh, hadith. Another one, chess. The, the hadith which, uh, apparently are quite simple and, and clear on, on chess. It says, Imam Ali is, is reported to have said, the chess and the dice are both considered gambling. Imam Sadiq is reported to have said, the messenger of God forbade from the playing with, with the chess and the dice. And what you see is a very different view on, and, on what you should do here. Um, Ayatul Sistani, for in, today's, uh, in terms of scholars today, Ayatul Sistani says it's haram. But Ayatul Khomeini was one of the first to say it was not haram. And then, you know, Ayatul Fadullah, Ayatul Asani, Ayatul Al Makar and Shirazi are, are other exception scholars who, who also say it's not haram. What I'm saying is that something which you look at, what, what I'm trying to get at here is people might show you, look at this hadith, it's clear. Clearly it's haram. What I am saying is don't fall for that. Don't say, when a scholar comes and says there is actually an, an argument which is different, just because somebody who you might know shows you a hadith saying, look, it says this, it doesn't necessarily mean much unless you understand the context. Unless you understand there might be hadith which say the opposite. Unless you understand there might be Quranic principles that say the opposite or mean the opposite. You cannot, when you see these hadith which people pass around and say this means that you shouldn't do this, you have to be careful. This is what this example sh hopefully shows with you. Let's look at an example of women, women as mujtahids. This is actually a very interesting um, uh, example. And you'll see from the, the conclusion that, that we come from this, uh, why it's so interesting. Um, firstly, there's, there's this uh, narration from Imam Sadiq and, and many similar narrations. I'm not saying that I agree with any of these narrations. I'm just saying this is what the narration says. And it says, be careful that some of you do not bring others to trial in front of the, the people of injustice. Instead, Heed the, the Rajul among you who knows. Now this is the, this is the narration that's often used to, to justify why women cannot be mujtahids. It's very interesting that this is the narration used because they use the word Rajul. Now, w firstly, we have to understand whenever you talk about narration, let's try and understand it properly. How, where did this narration come from? What, what, the first thing you do is you check what is the chain of narration. So I'm going into a bit more detail here. What is the chain of narration? And there's one person, there's someone called Abu Khadija Salim ibn Mukarram al-Jamal, who is the person who's a bit, who, have who people have differences of opinion on. One, you have um, Najashi, who's one of the big uh, Rajal scrolls of the past, who considers him to be a trustworthy person, this Abu Khadija person. Th he's also, Abu Khadija is also mentioned in, in Kamal Ziyarat, which is, Kamal Ziyarat is a, is, is, a, is a work where some scholars say if any of the scholars, any of the individuals within that chain of narration of Kamal Ziyarat, um, that person will be trustworthy just because they're there. But then Sheikh Tosi, for example, says that he's trustworthy in one place and actually in another place says that this person is weak when he, when he collates these things together. So s most people will argue, whilst there are some differences of opinion, this, this narration is one that can be relied upon. Okay, so now you've got this narration. What, what are the arguments that some people use? Some people say that this narration, just in and of itself, is sufficient to say that women should not be heeded and listened to as a job because the, 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 the narration says rajul, it says man. Or rajul 
means man is, is, is the argument here. And um, the, what they say is this is an, a, 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 a narration which actually talks about um, being a judge. And being a mujtahid is even higher than being a judge. And therefore, um, if being a man is a requirement of being a judge, then it's clearly, in this argument's view, a requirement of being a mujtahid. The other argument on the other side, which Ayatollah Khoui and others use, is that Rajab, well, I don't, I, I'm actually not sure if Ayatollah Khoui uses this exact argument, but um, the other argument that's used is Rajul in, is in contrast to the people of injustice. It's just saying, there are people of injustice, and there's somebody else who has... Um, who has a di who, who knows? And what it's trying to say is what this argument states is it's not saying men rather than women. It's saying the individuals rather than those who are unjust should be the people who judge. And in, and and regardless, you cannot make an analogy by saying if if a woman can't be a judge, that means they can't be a mujtahid. They're different things. You can't make such an analogy. Now, what what is very interesting is Ayatollah Khoui take, seems to take the second argument. He makes it very clear. He thinks um, he says. It's clear that this narration cannot be used to justify that women should, be, should not be mujtahids. He's very, very clear. No, no chance at all. How can you use this narration to, to justify it? It doesn't work. But then what's really interesting with Ayatollah Khoui is that he says, and he, uh, it, it's, it's really interesting, is he says, from the dhuq, the, uh, as, I, as I recall, uh, from the taste of the sharia, from his understanding of the Quran and the, the entirety of the context of what... Um, um, Islam says, as someone who's, who's, who's a scholar who understands this issue really well, his view is that the duty loved by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for women is being covered away from others and taking care of household affairs rather than entering what prevents duties such as taking care of household affairs. It does not please Allah, I'm, I, think I'm, I think I'm paraphrasing what he said, it does not please Allah that a woman is on show like this in any situation and he, would not, and he Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would not like her leading men in congregational prayers so how would he consider their position as the head of the affairs of society? In essence, summarizing what he's saying, is according to Ayatollah Khoui, he goes and says, the narrations are very clear that there's nothing stopping a woman being uh, a mujtahid. Nothing at all. There's no textual evidence to say that women can't be mujtahids. Women can be mujtahids. Based on the text alone, there's nothing stopping that women be. But my understanding from the entirety of everything that, we, that I understand from what I perceive from my understanding of the Quran, the Sunnah, and everything else, actually, that's not women's role. But what's really interesting is he, th this is a very important part of how he has chosen to, to derive that l rule. And it, it means that narrations by themselves sometimes can't be sufficient for him to make a conclusion. Uh, le let's look at a, another example. Um, oh, sorry, I didn't go to that one. Okay, fine. Um, is organ donation. Organ donation is, a, is another example which people talk a lot about. Um, and they are quite complicated. So there are a number of different narrations. Here are four of them which are considered to be sahih at the level that can be relied upon. And there are um, four of them. One of them saying, amputating the head of a dead person is worse than amputating the head of a person who's living. Uh, I asked Abu Abdullah about a man who cut the bone of a dead person. He said, the, the haram of... The, um, the, harm, the har haram of this when it's concerning a dead person is greater than if the person was alive. Uh, Allah disdains thinking about a mu'min except good. And if you cut um, his bones, whether the person is alive or dead, it's the same. Alive or dead, it's the same. And the fourth narration, he asked the person who cuts the head of a dead person and he, the Imam alayhi salam, said he has to pay dear as in blood money because it's forbidden when the person is dead in the same way as if the person is alive. Now, most of these narrations do not explicitly say they're talking about war, war or, or anything else. And therefore, in a pure sense, they can be applied in all situations if you use the iflaq principle. There's nothing preventing it to be used in other situations. Um, but and there's some exceptions. But in principle, these hadith are therefore used to justify the idea that, that it is wajib to respect the dead body and is haram to cut the body of a Muslim. And what's interesting here is it doesn't necessarily apply to non-Muslims, which is... Um, the, the view of, of these scholars, and therefore, um, and therefore, if you're not allowed to cut the body of a de uh, of a dead Muslim, that means you can't um, obviously be able to get the organs from that person. So that that's what the, these narrations might indicate in and of themselves. That's what some scholars say. But at the same time, we have the Quranic verse, 
which says whoever um, kills one person is as if they've killed the whole of mankind. If anyone who saves a life, it would be as if they saved the whole of mankind, implying that it's wajib to save a human being when you, when you have the opportunity to do so. So you have these contradictory situations. One saying, well, you can't really cut the dead body of a Muslim. And one saying it's wajib to try and save someone else. So how do you deal with this contradiction in place? This Quranic verse, and you have these hadith which are seen as sahih and reliable. What do you do and what do the scholars do? Well, the first one is that the, they try and, some people use the idea of tazahum, the idea of um, um, two things together happening. And I'll explain what this means in a second. So, I mean, um, when you have two wajibaks, you need to do one, and you have to do one, um, you have to do whichever one has greater weight. So for example, if this principle says that, if, let's say there's someone who's drowning in a river, and saving that person requires you jumping over a fence and going into someone else's land who isn't your own land to go and save that person's life. You have two contradictory situations in terms of what you have to do. The one thing is you have to save that person's life, and the other thing is you, you can't go into someone else's property who's not allowed. Um, in that situation, it's wajib to still save that person, so you, you, still, you can still do that. Now, can this principle be used in this case? Well, one, some arguments say, actually, the narrations are very specific in terms of not being able to cut someone, and therefore you can't use a general Quranic verse about saving when there is an exceptional specific case saying, no, you can't do this. That's, that's something which you can't do. Other people say, well, actually, you know what? The Quranic verse does take precedence, and you can, you can save that person's life, but only in a situation when it saves a Muslim life. That's one argument that some people say. Because they'd say that only when it's a Muslim life is it sufficient that you can use the Quranic verse to do it. Because the, the, the narrations are quite clear in terms of talking about um, cutting the body of a, a, a Muslim. And the other argument is, no, the Quranic verse will always take precedence. In whatever situation, the Quranic verse to clear, save the life of a human is more important than any of these things. So what is clear is that people use... Um, People use these narrations and people get to these conclusions and come to these different conclusions just by interpreting things in different ways and dealing with this contradiction in different ways. Now I'm going to come to the final example, I believe, is the one when it comes to the naj najasa of the Ahlul Kitab. Okay, now this is a, um, a, a view that, uh, that is, is quite important um, and, and it... And it's just in the Ahl Kitab. It's not um, uh, all Muslims. I'm just talking about the Ahl Kitab here. So you, ha you have the, the verse of the Quran which talks about Ya Amanu in al Mushrikun and Najisun. And then Fala Yakrabu Masjid Haram. Okay. So the question is the, the Mushrikun are indeed Najis, are, are indeed unclean or Najis. What does it mean? The point is that there are lots of different interpretations as to what should happen here um, and, and what Mushrikun means, but also what Najis means. And the end conclusion is that most scholars will say you can't use this verse in and of itself to say the Ahl al-Kitab al najis Fine. So what do you do then? Well, you have all these narrations which talk about this issue, that Ahl al-Kitab al najis And all of them are quite, are, 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 are mu'tabar, as in they're, they're reliable enough that you can rely on, that you can, you can act on them. Um, so for example, I asked Abu Abdullah about whether I could eat from the leftover of Jews and Christians. He said no. Um, in and of itself, that might consider the, mean that they are the Ahl al-Kitab al -Najis. Um I asked Abu Ja'far about a dish of Ahl al dhimma and Zoroastrians, and he said, don't eat from their dishes, and nor from the food which they have cooked, and nor from the cups in which they have drunk wine. Because the fact that they've, he, he's used the term wine might suggest that only because of the wine, that's the driver of the... Uh, uh, maybe, or maybe not. So it could be the case, or it could just be a general principle. And then you have... Um, many other narrations which have similar implications. If there weren't anything else, these narrations would be sufficient to say the Ahl Kitab and Najis. Because there's so many narrations saying something very similar that really can't easily be interpreted in another way. But there are other narrations. There are other narrations. For example, I asked Abu Abdullah about eating the fruit from a Jew and a Christian and a Zoroastrian. He said, if it is your food and, uh, and he's washed it himself, then, then there's no problem. Or there's another one which is a bit clearer. Um, the, uh, the second one, I entered into the presence of Abdul Abdullah and said, I'm a man from the Ahl Kitab and I become Muslim. The remainder of my family are all Christian and I'm with them in one house. I haven't left them, so can I eat from their food? He asked me, do they eat pig? 
He, said, uh, he replied, no, but they drink wine. So he said, eat and drink with them, it's fine. What this suggests, this and some of the other narrations, what these are trying to suggest is maybe it's not the actual fact that you're eating with Christians and Jews which is a problem, but it's if there is pork that there might be a problem. Regardless, what it's showing is there seems to be apparent contradiction between these different narrations. So what do you do when you have these, these um, contradictions? Well, first thing is you try and say maybe both of them are right. Is there a way to try and reconcile them? So some people say, some people say well, the narrations are implying the Ahl Kitab are Maybe it's just actually, these aren't saying that they're najis, just that it's better not to be with them. That could be one way of reconciling them. Another way is to prefer one set of narrations over the other. Either preferring the ones which, are, which say that they are najis or some that say that they're tahir. Those are the different ways that you, you, you go on. And what's really interesting, again, is Ayatul Akhoi. He is very interesting because what he does here is he says, he goes through the whole analysis of this in the same way, probably in far more detail. And he says, in the end, the, all the narrations, I come to the conclusion that there's no textual evidence which is strong enough to suggest the Ahl Kitab are Najis. Nothing at all. All of these ones that say they're Najis, I think that they are either say they're makru or they're not sufficient to, 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 to overcome the narrations which say they're Tahir. He says that all these narrations together. But what does he end up saying? His view, in the end, is that ihtiyat, ihtiyat wajib to avoid them. Why? Because he respects, in, in deference, in respect to the scholars of the past, he doesn't. He chooses not to take the, the, the final step in terms of saying it's, it's it, their tahir. He chooses to be just using ihtiyat not to take that final step. Because it's better to be safe than sorry, in essence. And that's very interesting because it's actually something that Ayatollah Khoui does a lot in many of his narrations. But what, what, when you look at this and you see the scholars here, these are the scholars, if vast majority, and I, I, I don't want to say all because I can't, I can't prove it, but vast majority, if not all scholars of the past said the Ahl Kitab al-Najis. Whether it is Sheikh Sadduq, we remember we, we mentioned all these people, Sayyid, Sayyid Murtada, Sheikh Tusi, Tabrasi, Ibn Adris al-Hilli, Muhakkal al-Awwal, and, and al-Thani later on, Adabili al-Bahrani. All of these scholars of the past, have said that it is Najis, that Ahl Kitab al Najis. In fact, Ayatul Bih Bahani, the person who was instrumental in changing the entirety of Shia thought uh, from Akbarism to Usulism, basically, it's not entirely true, but partially, he said, Ayatul Bih Bahani, he said it, it was, uh, and he was one of the most illustrious scholars of his age, he said it was this, one of the slogans of the Shia to say the Ahl Kitab al Najis. That's how important it was to this scholar. Ibn Idris, one of the scholars of the past, said there was consensus on the issue that Ahl Kitab al Najis. But despite that, today, the vast majority of scholars have the exact opposite opinion. The Ahl Kitab al Tahir. Despite the fact that almost every scholar throughout all the ages has basically said they're Najis, today, almost all the scholars say that they're Tahir. Almost all of them today. That is so powerful to demonstrate how some of these scholars of the past, when one person comes and has a difference of opinion, how we can transform the entirety of Shia thought on these issues. And there is another example of, of seafood, but that's quite, um, um, quite long, and I, uh, I'll talk about it if anyone's interested later on. There are lots of other examples out there which talk about how there are differences of opinion. One person has a different view, whether it is the fact that Muqaddas al Ardabili in the early days believed that alcohol was tahir, whereas most people think it's, it's uh, obviously, it's, it can't be drunk, but Muqaddas uh, al said it was at least fire. Um, that's the view of Ayatollah Fadullah today, but it was, it's a very minority opinion at the time. Um, uh, uh, the time of Maghrib, Sharif al murtada Ibn al-Junaid and the Sheikh Mufid said it was at sunset. Um, others, including Ala Mahilli, and the majority of the views today say you should wait a, a, a little while. But so many scholars of the past said something very different. But the key point here I'm trying to make is just because a ruling is very, very different to the mainstream doesn't make it wrong. And shouldn't be something that means that you can attack them and say... It, we have so many examples which show that that minority opinion can and has become the mainstream view of the future. And very, very quickly, this is not just on fiqh. Well, so that's been the focus of, of the discussion today. It's not just on fiqh. It's also on theology and aqaid. Um, there is the, the idea of the natural death of imams. So Sheikh Saduq said that all the imams were killed. Sayyid Murtad argued that only some of them were. Um, 
Alam Mamqani, one of the great scholars, talked about how many of the beliefs in respect to the status of the Imams are considered amongst the fundamental tenets of our faith once used to be considered amongst the most heretic extremist beliefs. What are you saying? The extremist beliefs of the past are now mainstream views of, in Shia thought, according to this scholar. And the major scholar that everyone agrees is one of the scholars that we should rely on in many regards. Even the idea of infallibility of the prophets, there are lots of different arguments about what that, the extent to that infallibility. It's changed through time, different people have different views. It's very, very interesting to see that. And the key theme is that even on fundamental issues of belief, there have been fundamental differences of opinion. So I'd like to end with, the, with, that, with that perspective, that diversity of opinion is genuinely a sign of our Shia heritage. It's there throughout our heritage. It, and these differences of views are part and parcel of our faith. And a minority opinion in the past can and has become the majority opinion in the present and the future. And therefore, in a minority opinion today, very well might end up being the majority opinion in the future. So we should celebrate and encourage and not censor these differences. Thank you very much. Salawat. Um, thank you very much. Um, as Salah time is upon us, uh, we will break for Salah and we will, inshallah, join for uh, question and answers after. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad.